join me in turning to the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6. Point out something to you, you probably already noticed. The color scheme for the slides is the Ukrainian flag. I just, I, I, we, we need to constantly be remembering what is happening in that part of the world. It's becoming less and less a part of our daily consumption of news. Uh, you know, they're, they're so quick to want to get back to fussing and feuding over politics. Uh, but you know what? We need, to, we need to realize things are not getting better over there. They're getting harder. And so we need to be in prayer for uh, the people of Ukraine and the, the Russian people and our world. And so in a moment, we'll, we'll have a prayer uh, and include that as, as a serious part of it, okay? But uh, first, let's look at and introduce our message today in Ephesians chapter 6. Are your kids growing up as fast as mine is? Man, it happened faster. <laughs> is that possible? Oh, it happens so fast, doesn't it? I, w- I want to tell an illustration that I... I, I I asked Millie's permission. She usually makes me pay money to use her in an illustration. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll owe her after this. Uh, and she has rights to, to demand it. But, you know, you, you, when they're little, they're just so something. You know, they're so cute. And I remember back uh, when she was very, very little, she just loved jokes. She still likes jokes. She loves to laugh, but uh, she really did love jokes. Even when there was no joke, she would just kind of pull a joke out of nowhere. And knock-knock jokes were were, were part of the repertoire because she she would say, knock-knock, and we'd say, who's there? And then she'd look around the room to see what she could find to say. (laughs) Knock-knock, who's there? Chair! (laughs) We'd all laugh, you know. (laughs) Knock-knock, who's there? Door! (laughs) You know, uh, it was just sweet days. Amen to that. I, 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 I say this and embarrass my dear daughter for this reason. Paul is doing something similar. He is looking around the room that he's in as he prays with the burden, as the Spirit is leading him to express and equip the people of God for spiritual battle, this, this very, 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 very important, critical teaching that he needs to equip the people in. He's looking around going, how is this to be structured? How is this to be? And he sees Roman soldiers everywhere. It's just such a a reality of the life that he was living that it seemed, along with his knowledge of Isaiah 59, 7, that says he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. And so... Paul is looking around the room and remembering Isaiah and structuring his teaching on spiritual warfare around the Roman armor, the Roman armor. And so that's what we're looking at, spiritual warfare. And today, the half of the Roman armor, there's six pieces. We'll look at three of them today. But last week, we looked at chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. We talked about the reality of the devil and his demons. They are real. They have, according to what we read last week, rule, authority, power, and evil in this world and in the heavenly realm. So they are, they're quite something. But there is no comparing their power to God's power. Amen to that? There's just no comparison to God. They are petulant, rebellious children that he can deal with forthwith. And we we, we talked about last week, the the 6,000 demons that Jesus spoke a word, and cast them out. Total control over 6,000, like nothing. And in fact, you know, we have in that casting out of the demons into the pigs, that first, uh, you know, uh, reference to deviled ham, the first and only reference to deviled ham in the scriptures. Yes. And uh, we get this muffled joke because that's retread from last week. Wait till we do it again next week. Then you'll be like, ugh. But with the word of the Lord's mouth, he does these things with demons. He casts them out. He controls them. Tells them to hush. He will win. Jesus will win the the battle of Armageddon, it says, with the sword of his mouth. I mean, there's just no comparing their power with his. And we really need to know 
that. In fact, I, uh, I, I, I'm just eager for, for, for no particular reason to share with you Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Uh, it says, the Lord has taken away your punishment. This is the gospel in the book of Zephaniah. How do you like that? The Lord has taken away your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that good? Man, I need to read more Zephaniah, the gospel there in Zephaniah. The devil has been soundly defeated, absolutely disarmed. We learned last week in Colossians 2.15 and completely defanged by the blood of Jesus. Revelation 12.11 says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And so the devil continues to be here, suffering setbacks when you share your testimony. You are victorious when you share your testimony. Share your testimony. Share your testimony. By all means, share your testimony. You'll defeat the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. But the devil's still here, filled with fury and rage and hate. He's still lying. He's still murdering. He's still stealing, killing, and destroying. He's still prowling around in dark shadows looking for someone whom he may devour. Watch out for the prowler. Watch out for him as he tries to sneak. You know how you're safe? Run with the herd. If you're safe, you want to be safe from a lion, run with the herd. The herd. Man, we'll take care of you if you run with the herd. But if you get off and leave us and you're off on your own, you're, you're vulnerable. Don't forget that. The devil's motivation is to destroy the world and everything good in it. He wants to damn God's people. And yes, I said damn. Because damn means to take somebody, to send somebody to hell. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to take as many people to hell with him as possible. But in hell, the devil won't be ruling. There, he'll be suffering the most. Don't forget that. We, we have these really, really wrong ideas about him and him being big and bad in hell. He's going to be the most miserable of all the creatures in hell. In the final days, he's making war on the world and opposing the work of God's church on mission. If you're lost, he wants to keep you that way. And if you're saved, he wants to chase you under a rock where you hide and, and don't make any waves so that he, he has total control of your little world, your little uh, atmosphere, your little situation, your home, chasing you under so that the only wave you make is the wave of the white flag. That's what the devil wants to do to you if you're saved. I want to show with you quickly without... Any commentary, because I've got to really be deliberate in time today. But I want to show you how the devil attacks us. And four of the five of these you'll see in the passage today. But he entices our flesh, exploits our weaknesses, engages our ears and eyes. That one won't show up too much in the sermon today. But remember how he engaged Eve by getting her into a conversation, trying to get her to listen to him. And he saw that her eyes saw that... The, the fruit looked good for eating, you know. He, so he, he, he capitalized on that. He exacerbates our emotions and he eclipses our mind. The battlefield of the mind is where he likes to attack. There's not, uh, you know, there's so much to say about these things. I, I, I hope that we can get more opportunity to talk about spiritual warfare. We need to take more opportunity to talk about spiritual warfare. I've got a, 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 a teaching I've done on spiritual warfare. The notebook's about that thick. I hope we can get into it. I really do. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he wrote two books, two full books on the, the, the armor of the Lord. 736 pages. We won't talk that much about the armor of the Lord in the next two weeks. The Puritan preacher William Gurnall in 1655 wrote three volumes 
261 chapters, 1,472 pages on the armor of the Lord. We won't be talking about it that much. I wish we could. We probably should. But time doesn't allow. And so we won't talk about everything we could talk about with the armor of the Lord. But my prayer is that we will talk about the things that we must talk about, that we need to talk about. Because we are struggling. We as a church family are struggling. We have members who are fighting battles, full-blown battles in their lives right now. And they need to know that God is with them in the battle, that he's empowering them in the battle. He's equipping them for the battle. They've got what they need, and they need to be told. And so let's get into these passages, turning to God. I don't know all of your problems today. I don't know all the battles that you're going through, but God most definitely does. And he'd like to speak to you today about them. So let's read Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in yourself and in your own mighty power. Oh, good. I'm glad. What can we possibly do in our own power? Yeah. Oh, friends, we don't have in ourselves what it takes. Let's take another run at that. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. How much of it? All of it. The full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Remember that. We'll, we'll talk more about it not being a struggle against flesh and blood. It's not. It's not. You may think it is, but it's not. We need to battle on the right battleground. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And that's where we'll stop today in our reading. Let's pray. Lord, as we do know that some of our people, many of our people are absolutely under attack. I pray, God, that we'll all remember and God, that we'll, you'll reinforce the reality that it's not against flesh and blood that we're struggling. God, please help us to be empowered by your mighty power, to be strengthened in that way, to be equipped with the weapons that you've provided, that you have fashioned for us. And God, as we think about that, we think about weapons that are being given to people on the battlefield. We think about the dear people of Ukraine who are fighting with whatever weapons they can cobble together or whatever has been brought to them across their borders. They're, they're fighting, God, for their lives. They're fighting for their home. Lord, we just, we just beg you to do something mighty for your glory and for their salvation. As a nation, as a people, and certainly for their souls, we pray, God, for salvation, that the whole world might know that there's a God in heaven who hears our prayers and answers and, and rescues people who are calling on his name. We pray, Lord, for those that are fighting. We pray, Lord, for the Russians who are attacking. God, turn them back. Turn them, tell them to go home. Tell them to go home. We pray, Lord, for the man who started this whole mess. That God will change his heart. Please, God, help us not to be sinners in failing to pray for them. Help us not to be sinners by failing to, uh, to lift them up. And so as the rest of the world moves on, help us to stand with Ukraine. And Lord, we pray God again for our lives now and the war that we're in. 
Help us not be negligent or ignorant of what is happening all around us and the devastation and destruction that the devil is doing because he's, he's being unopposed by the gospel and the testimonies of your people. Now, Lord, move us. Talk to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who is slain to take away the sin of the world, we pray. Amen. Uh, so, we have weaknesses. And the devil exploits our weaknesses. And he knows what they are. He's been watching us, his army. He's been watching us. He knows our sinful tendencies, our attitudes, our inclinations. He knows them, and we need to know them too, because that's where he's going to try to get us. Sins of pride or lustiness or greed or covetousness or fear, or things of that nature. We need to know ourselves well enough to know where the devil is going to come. Know where your flank is weak. He uses every opening. He uses any opening. If you look back to Ephesians 4.27, just back over here, it says, Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foothold. That Greek word is topos, meaning a place, a space, a seat, a passage, an opportunity. I, I, I call it an open door. Don't give him an open door. Don't, don't let him in. And that means that we need to put on not some of the armor of the Lord, right? But we need to put on the full armor of the Lord. Don't leave some off because he's going to get you where the gaps are. And so let's cover ourselves with this teaching and not give the devil an opportunity. You know the, the mythological story of Achilles? Some of you do. Some of you do, some of you don't. It's okay. Some of you are like, yeah, I heard that thing. What do you call it? You know. Achilles was, in, the, in, the, in Homer's myth, uh, he was a son of a, a, a regular man, and his mother was a sea nymph, whatever that is, named Thetis. And she dipped Achilles in the river Styx. I had to edit this because that woman had a wardrobe malfunction while she was dipping the baby. I don't know why that was necessary, but I said, well, you know, we're a rated G church around here. Even though I did say the D word, but I put it in context. But we have, so I, I, I edited the nudity so we could maintain our G status. But when Thetis dipped Achilles into the river, how did she hold him? She held him by the heel. Right. So she, she dipped him. So he had one vulnerability. Now, Achilles grows up to be a great warrior because he's invulnerable. And in the Trojan War, he, is, he fights for Agamemnon, the Greek, the Greek side. And, and he's just tearing the, the Trojans up in the war for years and years and years. He, he takes like 12 cities. He's, he, he's the warrior. Uh, but eventually, there's a, a man named Paris. And I have to admit, I haven't read all this, but uh, what I understand... There's a man named Paris who shoots an arrow that's guided by Apollo and it strikes him in the foot, his one vulnerable spot. He left the spot uncovered. And that's something that God has told us not to do. Put on the full armor. You, there's no spot that has to be uncovered. He, he, he's given us everything we need to be fully covered and ready for the battle. Totally protected. In verse 10, he says, be empowered. In verse 13, he says, be equipped. The full armor and every piece is essential. And so let's look at the first three piece, the three pieces, the three piece, I'm going to a three piece suit today. Let's the three pieces, the first three pieces of the armor of the Lord. And we'll just take it right out of verse 14. The first part, part is stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now this belt, or girdle, some of your Bibles probably says girdle, it holds all the other parts of the armor together. It, kept, it keeps the soldiers undergarments, and the other pieces of his armor from being loose. 
And in that way, he can do hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, you know, if he's got his stuff all jingling and jangling around, it's all moving with him and it's shaking and, 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 and fluff, fluttering and everything, like that, he can't do battle that way. And so the belt is there to cinch it all up, to secure it all up so he can be free to do war. That's, that's what the belt of truth is. And it needs to be girded and buckled and cinched up. Don't leave it all flopping around. Now, sometimes when we look at an object lesson that's as well known as the armor of God, we remember the object, but not the lesson. You know what I mean? Uh, I would say that if we talked about this after or before, if we talked about it before, you'll remember it after, but if we talked about it before, you know, what is the armor of God? You say, well, yeah, there's that belt. What's that belt again? What does it stand for? Well, let's not do that. Let's not get so caught up in the object that we forget the lesson. And I will tell you, when this often happens, I'm, I'm going to put some people on notice. Vacation Bible school is bad about objects becoming more important than the lesson. We spend a whole lot more time decorating that room. Don't we? And that room overshadows the point of the whole thing. So let's not just remember the belt. If, in fact, if you want to forget something, go ahead and forget that it's a belt. But remember the truth. Because the truth is the point of this. Put on truth. And what does it mean, the truth? I think some of y'all are mad at me now. You've turned me off because I said something about your decorations. <laughs> Come back. Come back. We'll make peace later. But the truth, what, what does it mean to, to put on the truth, to buckle up the truth, cinch the truth on? Well, there's two things, and there's two things in all one. Of, there's an A and B in every point today. Uh, the, the, the truth that we're talking about is veracity and sincerity. Veracity and sincerity. Pilate asked, what is truth? Well, is, truth is kind of hard to put your finger on nowadays because so many people have their own facts. But veracity is real truth. It's doctrinal truth. It's conformity to actual facts and reality and accuracy. The Greek word for this word, for the truth that is objectified by the... Uh, Belt is aletheia. You guys know anybody named aletheia? Aletheia is a Greek word for truth. And it means, I saw a big smile. Some of you guys know aletheia. I wonder if it's the same aletheia I know. Anyway, it means reality, not an illusion. That's what aletheia means in Greek. It's reality, not an illusion. When I, when I saw that, it made me think of something. It probably makes you think of something too. It made me think of Socrates and Plato. Is that where you went with that? Yeah, that's what I thought. 400 years, 400 years before the church of Ephesus, Plato presented an allegory, the allegory of the cave. He actually stole it from Socrates, but Socrates didn't publish it or write it or present it. And so Plato gets credit for what his teacher Socrates did, but the, 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 the allegory of the cave is this beep, boop, bop, boop, boop, bop. There it is. They love it when I do that. They, they do. They, 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 they just let me keep going for a while because they, they like to laugh. Um, the allegory of the cave is that there would be prisoners chained to, to rocks in a cave where they can only look forward, and all they see is shadows on a wall. These shadows on a wall are, are over their heads because there's a fire, and there's activity behind them. But they're not allowed to turn around. They, they can't see what's behind them. All they see is the shadows. And so they think that reality is these shadows. They, they hear talking. And they see the shadows moving. They go, oh, that shadow is talking now. It's moving. Or, or that, that buffalo over there, he's making a noise. Okay. And they think that's reality. The shadow's on the wall. But in the allegory, one of them gets free and, and, and escapes the cave. You're, yes, you remember. Yes. Okay. I'm glad. Correct me if I get any of this wrong. I'm sure I will. But he gets out and he looks and there's, he sees the fire. And he sees the people. He sees the animals. He sees the whole thing that's going on behind them that they never saw. Reality. And it blows his mind. 
It bl- what? Whoa! And so he goes back into the cave to tell his friends about reality. The reality they thought they saw was not reality at all, but it was, there's more. And guess what his friends did? They wouldn't believe him. Now, Plato is not a man who believed in the Lord God. He was a pagan. He was a Greek, believing in his philosophies and things of that nature. But he's not wrong in coming to realize that what we see here is not all that there is. Amen to that? What we see here is not all that there is. There's authorities and rulers and principalities and powers and evil forces in the heavenly realms. There's more than we see. You know, the matrix is actually something similar to that story. Like where you see a reality, but it's not reality. You're in the matrix. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? It's okay. Go home and watch all four or five of those, and you'll know. Or the Truman Show, you know? It wasn't reality, was it? It was, there was more. There's more. Well, the believer whose eyes begin to see, they're open to the reality of God and what He's doing in the world. His heart's been filled his, he's experienced the love of God. He was dead in his sins. Now he's alive in Christ. He now has a personal testimony. I've seen that there's more, so much more. All the, 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 all the joys of life, all the peace of life, all the, all the good things of life have been multiplied by a factor of 900 because he's seen the reality of Jesus Christ and come to faith in God. The people may or may not believe the testimony when we tell them. Putting on God's belt of truth is putting on the actual truth. The veracity. The truth. My favorite verse is 1 Peter 1.8. Though you've not seen Him, you love Him. Though you've not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy reality. The veracity of the truth that we buckle up. Not only veracity, but sincerity. We put it on. John Stott says this truth is more, uh, more like, to, uh, in this passage, more like integrity. Like Psalm 51, 6, where it says to God, Behold, you desire truth in the inmost being. That, that truth that is genuine. So that our sincerity, when we buckle this up, we're putting on truth as a commitment to genuine, authentic, actual engagement in the Christian life. We're we're buckling up saying, I'm in this. I believe this. I'm living it. I'm not going to be a wobbly, weak, watery little person who's just playing at Christianity. I'm putting on my belt. I'm getting in this. And I'm serious about it. I want you to think about When we play with faith and our belt is not buckled, our tunic is not secure. Amen. (laughs) When we're just playing at this and we have not buckled up in the truth of integrity, the actual Christian life, then our belt is not buckled and our tunic is not secure. And what happens to your tunic, your unsecured tunic, when the winds of doctrine blow? Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I was thinking, too. Flip back with me. I really want you to turn to Ephesians 4.14. Let's go back to chapter 4.14. It says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. And by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. The the wind will blow. The wind will blow. And if we're not secured, well, we're going to be shamed. We're going to be exposed. 
Where does the, the wind come from? I want to show you where the wind comes from. Uh, well, before we read verse 15, let's go to 1 Timothy 4.1. It says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That's where the wind comes from. This is spiritual warfare. The, uh, introducing doctrines and, and, and heresies to, that, that, that lead people astray, cause them to sway wobble around. Such teachings come from hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. So the, the winds that cause people to stumble have their genesis in, with demons. We go back to Ephesians 4.15. Instead, speaking of the truth and love, we will now grow to become in every respect mature the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. So there's sincerity in this truth. Let's, let's, let's cinch up our tunic and not let demonic doctrines sway us around or blow up our tunic and cause us to be shamed with error and insincerity. The second piece of equipment that we see here is the breastplate of righteousness. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. This righteousness also has two aspects, the imputed righteousness and the, the our positional righteousness and the practical righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Now, I'm going to just kind of give this to you guys because everybody needs to know about imputed righteousness. Okay. How, how righteous are you apart from Christ? How righteous are you? How much righteousness do you have? What is your righteousness really like? Isaiah 64, 6. All, somebody just said it. All our righteousness, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Filthy rags. No one is righteous, no, not one. So the best that we can do is filthy rags. Not the worst, but the best, okay? That means that to come to Christ, we need to repent of our righteousness. We need to repent of the good stuff we've been doing. Because it's filthy rags. I want you to think about this rag. I won't tell you what it's filthy with, although we know what it's filthy with, and it's disgusting. But let's just, just, just leave that part alone. Just know that it's filthy. It's gross, and it's stinky and nasty. And we're taking this rag, and we're trying to clean stuff with it. Cleaning ourselves with this filthy rag. Because we think our righteousness is so outstanding, we wash ourselves in it, wipe ourselves in it, wash things in it, and we just keep smearing the filth and the stink and the stain of sin all around. And that's our righteousness. Soiled. When Sherry was a little girl, I have to pay for this one too. When, when Sherry was a little girl... She used to spend her Sundays at her aunt's house on the farm. And her aunt didn't have an indoor bathroom. When they took baths out at the farm, they had a big tub filled up. And it dawned on little Sherry when she was a little girl that the bathroom in her house was much nicer than the outhouse at the farm. Much nicer. There was no comparison. It really dawned on her that that wasn't very fair, that the outhouse was so much dirtier than the bathroom at home. And so one Sunday, little Sherry decided she's going to go and she's going to take some stuff. She's going to clean that outhouse so that it'll be clean like the one she has at home. It's never going to happen, is it? Never going to happen. And our righteousness is never going to be clean just because we keep wiping our same filthy rag all over ourselves. Look at Romans 4.1. I'll have it on the board for you here. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? What, what, what should we say that he discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, that means declared righteous by works. If, if something that he did made him righteous, he'd have something to boast about, but not before God. But what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
God has all the righteousness. Do you know that? There's no righteousness anywhere else. None of us have it in ourselves. You can't find it anywhere else. There's no righteousness in Buddha. There's no righteousness in Mohammed. There's no righteousness in, in, in any other place other than God. He's got it all. And he credits it to those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. He gives it to them so that they have imputed righteousness. Not because of anything they did. Nothing they did, but because God credited it to them because of their faith. And so it's by grace you're saved through faith, and there's now no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is this important when we're talking about the armor of God? Because the, the, the breastplate covers what? Heart. Okay? It covers your vital organs, and especially the heart, or the liver in their case. They, they felt like what we see the heart, they kind of see the liver, but in these organs is, are our emotions. Our emotions are in these organs. And this breastplate of righteousness, God's righteousness, protects us so that the devil can't affect our emotions. If we leave a gap, if we don't put on the breastplate of righteousness, then we're, we're, we're opening up our heart to be affected with emotional turmoil. So we let the, the righteousness of God cover our emotional well-being, our heart. The devil attacks by exacerbating our emotions. He tears us down to wear us down with, with discouragement and shame and fear and anger and other debilitating emotions. We leave a gap in the breastplate of righteousness and he has access to our heart. But a righteousness is God, from God is credited to the believer, the imputed, positional righteousness of God. Also be the practical righteousness of God. Remember, and that's sanctification. We had justification, now we have sanctification. Remember Ephesians in verses, I'm sorry, chapters 1 through 3 talks about our position in Christ. It's our positional righteousness. He has declared us righteous. He seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. We have this position because of His grace. But beginning of our, in chapter 4, going through chapter 6, verse 9, we have this practical righteousness where he's like, okay, now live this life that's worthy of what he's done for you. Now let the practical righteousness that he's placed inside of you begin to come out. Let the Holy Spirit sanctify you and change you into being a person who's more like Christ Jesus. So that's our righteousness. And for 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says... Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day as the Holy Spirit is, continues to increase our sanctifi the sanctification of our lives and our righteousness, our practical righteousness. Number three. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Feet fitted with the readiness from the gospel of peace. There's two, there's an A and B with this, okay? If we come to these feet, this readiness of the gospel, the first thing we need to see is that we are to stand with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Stand, right? Look at, look at verse 13 and 14 again. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and that's, that's when... It all falls on you, okay? I mean, we're, we're living in the, the age where the devil is the prince of this world. And so all these days can be considered evil. But there might be a day when everything falls on your head. That day of evil, it can be any given day for any of us. But when that day comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground. And after you've done everything to what? Stand Verse 14, verse 14, stand firm then. We have, we have four stands in three verses. I think the Lord's trying to tell us something. It, that verse 13 is, is just kind of silly how many times it says stand. And then again, to stand. Stand firm then. Stand. Stand. I didn't call you stand. 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 So what are we trying to see here? What's the Lord trying to say? The gospel peace... And the ready shoes. 
Look at Romans 5.1. Therefore, since... And look at the words, the repetitive words that we've just seen. Therefore, since we've been justified or declared righteous, righteousfied, made righteous through faith, we have what? Peace. Have your shoes, your feet fitted with the shoes, with, with the gospel of peace. Readiness in the gospel of peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now what? Stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You know what this verse says to me? It says that God has, He wants us to be secure. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to be safe. He wants us to be firm in our foundation, confident and at peace in our salvation in Christ Jesus. That's what He wants. And so that we can boast about it. I'm going to heaven. You going to heaven? I'm going to heaven. I'm sure of it. Now, these shoes, the Roman soldier shoes, these are good shoes. They don't go to battle in flip-flops. You know what I mean? I don't know about you, but I've about killed myself in Crocs a few times. But these are good shoes. These are shoes, I mean, when they, when they march a long way, they don't get crippled with blisters on these. These are good shoes. And they actually, I learned as I studied this, they actually have studs on the bottom. They, they have broken off nails on the bottom to, to grip, to hold firm, to make their stand. This is, the point of this is to make their stand. Have shoes that are solid, that grip, to hold the ground. Hold the ground. And they'll go slipping and sliding everywhere. Slipping and sliding because you don't have shoes that are ready with the gospel of peace. Secure shoes. The gospel of peace. What is the gospel? You need to stand in it. It's the gospel of peace. What is the gospel? Do you know the gospel? Jesus died for your sins according to Scripture. And He was buried. And on the third day, He rose again. And then He ascended. I'm sorry, first... He was seen by many. I mean, he was witnessed by many. And then he ascended to heaven up in the clouds. And, and two angels stood there and they said, the same way that you saw him come up is the same way he's coming back down again. And he's coming soon. Soon he's coming. And his greatest desire more than anything else is that you be saved, that you are forgiven, that you are in his forever family for all time. He loves you. That's the gospel. And he's calling your name. And he wants you to, to come and, and, and believe in him, place your faith in him, trust him. That's what he wants. That's what he wants more than anything. That's the gospel. And you can give your life to him, and you can give your life to him today if you've never done that before. I pray you will. I've been praying that you will. So that you can stand in the gospel of peace with, with good footing with God. And finally, not only do we stand in the gospel of peace, but we share the gospel of peace. We need to tell somebody. Tell somebody. Remember what it says in Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. This world is coming to an end, and it's coming to an end quickly. And all the people of this world are going to face judgment. The adversary, the devil, wants to drive you under a rock so that you hide and you don't make waves and you wave a white flag and you're not in the battle. Because he wants to take as many as he can with him down that eternal hole of suffering and hell. And so... God is telling us to put on the belt of what? Truth, veracity, and sincerity. Don't play at this Christian life. Be serious. Get in it. Be real. Put on the breastplate of what? Righteousness. And put on the shoes ready to stand in and share the gospel 
of peace. We're going to have a moment of decision. Our musicians are going to come, and I'm going to pray for you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then there's no peace outside of that. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. I, uh, I know sometimes I'm preaching away the gospel and somebody will give me a stink eye from out there. I see those stink eyes. It is not my job to make you feel comfortable about your lostness. It's just not. It's just not. And so if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior... You're living with no peace and no hope. You're you're looking at the wall of shadows. And there's a whole lot more to this life than you could possibly know until you put your faith in Him. Would you like to join the church? This church is open and it's growing. Praise God, praise God, praise God. But we don't have everybody we're supposed to have as He's building this church. And if you're supposed to be a part of this church, come down forward today and say, I'm ready to to start the process. What's God telling you to do today? Let me pray for you. Lord, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time. Thanks for the empowerment. Thanks for the equipment. And God, yes, we are suffering struggles, facing battles, but you're there. You're never going to leave us. You're giving us what it takes. And so God, teach us. Teach us how to get through this using your mighty power and your full armor. Now, Lord, in this moment, help us to respond to what you're telling us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And if God's calling you to make a public decision today, why don't you come?